Welcome back to Screen View Mirror. I'm your host, Emma, and you're listening to Screen View Thoughts. Now, on this episode, I'll be looking at Stanley Kubrick's 1975 Barry Lyndon. I figured if we're going to do another Kubrick film on this channel, we might as well tackle the absolutely visually stunning Barry Lyndon, one of Kubrick's lesser known films, but nonetheless a masterpiece in terms of cinematography. And that's really the axis of, uh, of discourse that I want to take today. I really want to talk about the technical aspects of the film, why it looks so good, and um, give you a little bit of context as to why Kubrick made the film, but I do not really want to get into the plot or the narrative or the storyline. So without further ado, Barry Lyndon. Now, Barry Lyndon, like a lot of Kubrick's films, is based off of a novel. And in this case, it's uh, William Makepeace Thackeray's uh, the Life of Barry Lyndon. I actually don't remember the title of that book because I never read it, but uh, it's one of his less successful novels, and I don't want to read it. Uh, I've already seen a visually stunning film. I don't think that my imagination could uh, make up for that. And also, the book is written in first-person narration in a very unlikable and unreliable way, kind of like Humbert Humbert, but in also, the the apparently, the wording of the book is just so dense and dry that you just, I don't know, I don't want to read it, but all right. So Thackeray, he's the guy that wrote Vanity Fair. Actually, Kubrick uh, thought of doing a movie on that, but then he decided that Vanity Fair was much too heavy to work with. So he went with the Barry Lyndon story and here we are. Um, and so the plot is basically about an Irish gambler who's incapable of quitting while he's still ahead. Uh, it uh, follows his rise and fall in uh, in English society, and that is all I will say about the narrative. Now, Frontrunner magazine said of the film, and I quote, there are individual frames of Barry Lyndon that could be blown up, framed, and displayed on the walls of any fine art museum in the world, end quote. And why is that? Well, first off, Kubrick had actually studied the art of the era. Uh, the novel is written in the 19th century, but it's about the 18th century. Um, a lot of the work of Henry Fielding and Samuel Pepys kind of influenced the novel, so it's it's dense, but it's it's very uh, time specific, and I feel like Kubrick really wanted to get it right with the the period drama setting for the film and he did an immense amount of research on the art of the era he studied the paintings of constable gainsborough joseph wright of derby uh george stubbs joshua reynolds so he studied all of that and and he got a great team of costume designers as well to make sure that every single detail was immaculate and just accurate um and and that's part of why the film looks like it's basically a painting that's come to life so he studied the art of the era and i think that that is what laid the foundation for the good cinematography because when you're looking at cinematography yes it's a matter of technique but it's a matter of technique only after the broad strokes and the and the general decisions have been made and in this case the general decision was to make it look like it was out of the 18th century basically so as for the technical aspects uh the cinematography was done by john alcott who i believe also worked on uh clockwork orange and uh he worked with kubrick on the cinematography of barry linden and so what kubrick did was he used a uh, Zeiss 0.7 f.7 lens that was actually used by NASA when taking photographs of the moon landing. And so he ordered that lens and he modified it. Well, not himself, obviously, but he, he got it modified uh, so as to be able to shoot motion pictures with that lens. And the particularity of this lens is that it's very tricky to use in the sense that 
a lot of the frame is out of focus. So if you're filming a scene with low key lighting and a 0.7 lens and the actor moves, for example, that actor can go to a part of the frame that's completely out of focus and you're just dealing with a kind of a depth of field that's very difficult to uh, focus basically in essence and i i hope i'm making sense but that was one of the one of the difficulties that they had to surmount especially in the indoor scenes since they used candles for a lot of the lighting not all of it but uh a lot of it it was difficult to get uh get the frame to look like it was in focus but they actually used so okay here's what they did um they used a separate camera, like a CCTV camera with a monitor next to, well, actually at a 90 degree angle from the 0.7 lens camera. So they had the camera um, shooting the, the scene for the film, but then 90 degrees from that camera, they had a separate camera with a monitor and they drew lines on that monitor of where the frame was in focus and where the frame was out of focus. So that way they could measure the extent to which the characters could move or shift around within the frame without uh, basically going out of focus. And that saved them a lot, of, uh, a lot of retakes, even though they did have to shoot a lot of the scenes multiple times. Um, so you can you can tell that the technicality of all of this was just I, I I still can't I still can't believe the effort that went into making this film. But uh, yeah, so that was their their problem in terms of um, focusing and, and depth of field and the legendary 0. 0.7 lens that was used by NASA and uh, also in the film. So let's talk a little bit more about the indoor uh, shooting. So. The other thing that made that technically difficult was that because a lot of the scenes used candles and Kubrick wanted the candlelight to make it all authentic and just um, low-key lighting and, you know, the, the 18th century feel and the chiaroscuro uh, f looking frames. So because they used candles in those indoor locations, that meant that there was a lot of smoke and there was a lot of heat coming from those candles. And that made the indoor shooting difficult, not to mention that they were all shot on real location. Like the set was real. Uh, those were all, most of them were museums. And so whenever they were, were shooting in palaces and let's say if, if the palace is a museum and so there are visitors and tourists coming through, they actually had to section off certain rooms and quarters of the place so as to deter people from coming in and, I, I just, I can't, I still can't get over the amount of work that went into this. Um, but yeah, so they, they, they used completely real set locations and uh, candles, real candles. So there's that. And also they, uh, John Alcott decided to put tracing paper on the windows. So he taped tracing paper on the windows to sort of diffuse the light that was coming through during the daytime. And to give the room a more dark kind of aesthetic feel and that way also to brighten the, the candles um, when they were being used. So I found that quite special when I was reading about uh, the making of Barry Lyndon. But then in terms of uh, shooting outside, I'd say that objectively it was easier for them, but then again, uh, weather conditions, you know, there's the if the clouds start moving, Kubrick can, can control his actors, but he can't control the weather. So uh, during certain scenes, for example, in the film, you can notice a cloud moved or shifted or I don't know how you call it, like the wind happened. <laughs> the, the wind happened and the shade changed. And you could, you could notice that in the film. But I really enjoyed that about the film because it, it gave it a very real look. Like during a scene, in the middle of a scene, because someone is talking and they're breathing out onto a candle and the candle is flickering and that changes the lighting. That is so, I don't know, it's just very, very real. Here's what John Alcott said about uh, Barry Lyndon, and I quote, uh, the story of Barry Lyndon took place during a romantic type of period, although it didn't necessarily have to be a romantic film. I say a romantic period 
because of the quality of the clothes, the dressing of the sets, and the architecture of that period. Uh, these all had a kind of soft feeling. And I think, an end quote, and I think that... Um, the lighting and the the choice in costume design and the choice of of framing and the slow burn sort of zooming in onto the scenes really really captures that well so uh those were my thoughts on the some of the techniques that were used during Barry Lyndon and I hope you will go watch this movie if you haven't already. I decided to make it a podcast episode and not a video essay because I really want to encourage you to watch the whole film. I think it's worth it. It sounds like, I mean, it it sounds kind of daunting, but definitely go for it. You don't have to necessarily like period dramas or Kubrick to enjoy the beauty and uh, masterful art of, of this uh, cinematography. So uh, those were my thoughts on the cinematography of Barry Lyndon. I know there's a lot more left to say, but uh, I will leave it up to you to fill in those gaps. And I will see you next week, or rather you will hear from me next week. Thanks for listening. This was Screenview Thoughts.